Welcome to World Mycotoxin Report Impact 2022, a webinar brought to you by DSM Animal Nutrition and Health and Romer Labs. My name is Josh Davis and I'm the Communications Manager at Romer Labs. It's nice to be here again with you. And this time is a little bit different as we have several firsts to celebrate. One of them is that we're presenting this webinar to you for the first time as DSM. Not only is Romer Labs a part of DSM, Biomin has also been fully integrated into DSM Animal Nutrition and Health. So before we start, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce today's speakers. Anneliese Müller, Global Product Manager for Mycotoxin Risk Management at DSM. She's responsible for the global survey. And also with us today is Nora Kogalnik, Product Manager at Romer Labs. So a fine welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anneliese, you were here last year to present the mycotoxin survey. Now, a lot has happened since then, hasn't it? Hi. Yes, that's certainly true. So we are now part of a new business line, the Performance Solutions and Biomin, within the DSM Animal Nutrition and Health Group. We are focusing on improving the sustainability and profitability of animal farming, and it's great to be one team. This also means that the Biomin World Mycotoxin Survey has a new home and a new name now, the DSM World Mycotoxin Survey. And we're going to be hearing a lot about the survey, of course, in just a few minutes. But first, let me also bring Nora into the conversation just a little bit. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm fine. Tell us, what have you, what have you prepared for us today? What will you be talking about? First of all, it's nice to be here. Today, I'll be saying a thing or two about the important roles that sampling and sample preparation play in achieving accurate mycotoxin testing results. So thank you, we're all looking forward to hearing about that as well. Now, I promised several firsts to you. Um, yes, this is, as you can see, the first time that we are doing this in a studio, but more importantly, for the first time, more mycotoxin experts will be joining us later to focus on individual regions, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, Asia Pacific, and thirdly, the Americas. As always, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar. We will answer all your questions afterwards by email. This doesn't mean that we won't be hearing from you now, though. Several of you asked questions when you registered, and these questions will inform our discussion after the presentations. So with this, I think we're ready to go. What can you tell us about the current picture of mycotoxin occurrence, Annalisa? There's a lot to say, but I want to start with giving you a global presentation of the mycotoxin survey data 2021. The mycotoxin survey is part of the technical services we offer to our customers. We collect data from their feed material samples to help them understand which mycotoxins are found at which concentrations and the potential threat to their animals. In 2021, we counted over 24,000 samples and over 112,500 analyses have been made to detect the six my main mycotoxins in different raw commodities and in finished feed from over 75 countries. The already high number of over 112,000 analyses performed refers only to the detection of the six main well-known mycotoxins. When we consider multi-mycotoxin analysis that we offer, the overall number of analyses will be much higher. Well, let's have a look at the worldwide contamination. Let me explain how to read this map. For all of the subregions, we listed the prevalence for the main six mycotoxins analyzed in the boxes. You can see how many samples tested positive for aflatoxins, for serolinone, deoxynivalinol, T2 toxin, fumonisins, and ochrotoxin A. In this world map, the subregions are colored according to the overall risk due to mycotoxin contamination in all of the samples in this subregion. Yellow means that the risk is moderate, orange that risk is high, going up to severe in dark orange and reaching extreme indicated in red. So how do we decide in this, on this risk indication? We define risk thresholds for the different species and the different mycotoxins. This is based on worldwide practical experience, on field trials, on scientific publications and regulations. And if mycotoxin concentrations exceed these risk thresholds, this can already have negative effects on the health of animals. Depending now on how many samples exceed these risk thresholds, we do our coloring scheme, scheme of the map. So if more than, if less than 25% of the samples um, contain a mycotoxin above this risk threshold, we will indicate this with moderate risk in yellow. 
if more than 75% of the samples contain mycotoxin at the concentration above this risk threshold, we will indicate this as extreme risk in red. And what we can see is that most regions and subregions are at severe risk. It's North, Central and South America, Central and Southern Europe, as well as Middle East and Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa. In Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, we see a bit reduced risk, but still a high risk. And moving more to the East, we can see that China and Taiwan, as well as South Asia, are at extreme risk. In East Asia and Southeast Asia, risk is severe. And as last year, risk in Oceania is moderate. Let's take a global overview of all of the samples. And here we can see that 61% of the samples are contaminated with a mycotoxin at a concentration that can already harm the animal, the health and the performance of the animal. Therefore, we consider global risk as severe. In 64% of all the samples that have been measured, which have been measured for more than three mycotoxins, we can see that more than one mycotoxin was found. So the co-contamination is very high. And this means um, that it can even have a more detrimental effect on the animal health because of possible synergistic effect of the multiple mycotoxins. What is now influencing the occurrence of mycotoxins? Fungi can produce mycotoxins on the crop in the field and during storage. The development of the fungi is strongly dependent on weather conditions during critical times in plant development, such as flowering, and also during harvesting. The temperature, the hours of rain, all this is crucial. And furthermore, environmental stress has a significant consequence on fungi infection. If plants already struggle with difficult conditions, their defenses against fungi can be less effective. Environmental stressors can be floods, droughts, but also insect attacks. And there is a lot of evidence that extreme weather events, which are on the rise due to climate change, cause stress and are a main trigger for mycotoxin occurrence. I was just very briefly looking for extreme weather events in the last year. And as I'm living in Central Europe, of course, I had in mind the heavy flooding in Central Europe, in Germany, Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands and Switzerland. But those extreme weather events um, also occurred in Americas and in Asia. Well, thank you for these insights, Anavisa. Um, now, for our audience, you mentioned at the beginning the many analyses that you were doing with multi-mycotoxin methods. Uh, will you go into greater detail about that later? Yes. Additionally, to the six main mycotoxins, a selection of our samples is analyzed for over 50 and some for even over 500 different mycotoxins and metabolites. And those results will be included in our mycotoxin survey report as well. Well, fantastic. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, but first, we're going to focus on Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And for this, I'm happy to introduce to you experts from the region, Wolfgang Markert and Sander Jansen, both regional product managers in EMEA. Thanks a lot, Josh, for the nice introduction. And also thanks, Anneliese, for the great introduction of the mycotoxin analysis and the risk of mycotoxins. Now we speak about Europe, Middle East, and Africa. My name is Wolfgang Markert. I'm the product manager for mycotoxins in the region Europe, Middle East and Africa. I'm here with my colleague. Sandro Janssen, good morning. Um, I'm also the product manager, mycotoxin risk management in the AMAA region. We have two parts. The first part is a little bit about Europe and Sandra will take over Middle East and Africa. If you look, uh, to the first slide, you see here a big number sets 44% risk level. What means that? This is a risk for an animal to come in contact with contaminated feed. This is 44%. That means one out of two animals will be exposed to micro mycotoxin risk. If you compare the map with the two big colors, you see Europe. But in Western Europe and in Southwest part of Europe and Turkey, we have a higher risk uh, that the animals will be harmed by mycotoxins. 
if you look to Scandinavia, Great Britain, Ireland, and you see the uh, big landmass of Russia and the other European countries, you see a moderator risk. But nevertheless, there is still a higher risk that animals will be harmed by mycotoxins also in these regions. Now we go more in detail. You see in this overview, where are the bullet points? If you go directly to Don, there you see we have a slightly smaller prevalence number than in the year 2021 compared to 2022. However, the risk for the animals is nearly similar. For swine, poultry and shrimps, we have a higher risk for non-contaminated feed. Also, you know, in Europe, we not grow up so much shrimps, but it could be interesting that you know that in Europe, feed could be also harm some shrimps. If you look to the other toxins, you see nearly similar prevalences there. However, there is only a moderate risk for all other mycotoxins like Aflar, Zen, T2, Fum, and Orta. If you look also to dairy here, there is only a moderate risk. However, we have to look a little bit deeper for dairy in the next slide. Cereals still higher contaminated, and we found a higher level of 22,400 ppp DOM and should be not feed to any animals. Such a grain should be destroyed. Also interesting for this northern part of Europe that the uh, T2 prevalence increased over the last years. That is also related to the climate and the strain of the Fusarium uh, fungi. If you got a little bit deeper to some interesting slides, then we see here the European corn silage. You see here that we have 80% prevalence for Don, 71% followed by Zen, and with 55 by Fuminusin. If you look to the table, how many samples we have tested, you see in the first line. The second line is the average of the positive sample. It means that only results over the limit of detection are used for this average. The maximum level you see in the second and uh, third row, sorry. The average looks like normal with 705 ppb, but be aware that it's in fresh matter content of the corn silage. Also very interesting is this number. The limit of detection is only 7%. We find less samples which are free of mycotoxin. Corn silage is really contaminated with a lot of mycotoxin and you have to take care about it. If you now go to the Poland um, corn silage, as an example, and here is the interesting point. We have 100% more than one mycotoxin, and the DON levels is much higher uh, with 1,645 ppb. However, here we have to notice that a lot of samples are analyzed in dry matter, and there we have then a higher average. Don is followed by Zen with a moderate level of 135 ppb and also with a maximum of 1000 ppb. There's also the risk that you get some fertility problems if you feed such a corn silage in dairy rations. If you go to straw, it's very important for bedding, for by sows or for some fattening pigs, and also by dry cows. Please don't forget the cows, then they are get straw as bedding and sometimes in their starter feed in form in the muesli feed. There is a strong insight, and if you look, you have here also a prevalence for don of 55% and with an average of 600 
and a maximum of 5,000 ppb. So you can imagine that could be also a risk for the animals, so you have to take care. We have only 2% prevalence of positive samples for aflatoxin, but some straw could be contaminated with aflatoxins. If you go for Germany now for the wheat, yeah, so it means by 267 samples, we have an average of 945 ppb. So that's really a high level and you have to take care. Please control your wheat every time if you buy wheat. Ten is also very high and could be also have negative effects on the animals. The prevalent for Don is only 55%. And by the end of the day, it's very important that also the risk increase here. If you now go to some grains, uh, corn from Hungary, you see also here a high prevalence in Don. And we have also high levels of positive results with 600 ppb and a maximum of 3000 ppb. For Afla, Zen, Fum, we have a lower prevalence. However, the average show some high levels. We found also 76% of samples with more than one mycotoxin. Please take care if you import corn from Hungary. If we go to Russian corn, yeah, you see that's more a problem for Russia internally, but here you see we have a medium prevalence. We also see a lot of mycotoxins in Russian corn. Etheria, you see there, all five mycotoxins show here some risk levels. Especially T2 toxin could be the interesting part. You have also to take care about T2. And don't forget that AFLA could be also a problem. We see only a prevalence of 2% with aflatoxins. However, some corn have high levels of aflatoxin and could harm animals and humans. Now we go to the Croatian corn. You see also some incidences of aflatoxin, don and fum. For don, we have also a high prevalence of 98%. We also take care, uh, or we should take care, to import Croatian corn. If we now go directly to Italian corn, that's very interesting. Here you see the major problem is aflatoxin. 41 prevalence for aflatoxin is really a high incidence to get a problem there. We get also high levels of aflatoxins in average with 80 ppb, and you know aflatoxins also transported uh, to the milk and can also harm humans. So we have to take care about this problem. A very high level is fuminosine, and here you see high levels with 6,000 ppb in average. 91% of the samples are contaminated with more than one mycotoxin. Well, let us go now to the Scandinavian wheat. I think I want only to point out one point. There are this high prevalence in T2 with 51%. Here we have the climate situation and the right fusarium strain that we have here a higher T2 contamination, and T2 is much more toxic than Don. Nevertheless, uh, you have also Don, also in the sample inside. Very important is also, if you have a high T2 level, you will also found high T2 inside the samples. If we now go to France, you see a similar result but the tendency is higher. The average of positive samples with 600 ppb done are very high. 
we have 90% prevalence and we have also more than 60% of the samples are contaminated with more than one mycotoxin. Pen follows dung with a prevalence of 57% and average levels of 86 ppb. Please have also to look to the maximum level of 60,000 ppb done and 2,200 ppb sent. Only 5% are under the detection limit, show clearly the higher risk of French wheat for the animal health. Now we go to the Romanian uh, barley. That is also surprising, and it's a little bit uh, um, new because barley normally moderate in mycotoxins. Last years we have a very high ton average content in a moderate to a high SEN average level. The maximum level is also very high. In some years, this is possible, and we had this also some years ago in Germany and in other Western Europe countries. Therefore, take care if you import barley from Romania for feeding reasons. My last slide from my presentation will looking to wheat from Ukraine. Ukraine export some wheat to different countries, and you see here the average of positive samples is 700 ppb, and the maximum is 4,000 ppb. These levels are a high risk for younger animals if you put such a wheat in the rations. You see also the high prevalences in the sample with 75%. Please take care by the import of wheat. Now I'm ready with Europe. And I give over directly to Sander. Sander, you can start. Yes, thank you, Wolfgang, for this uh, nice overview of Europe, including Russia. As mentioned uh, before, I will now present the mycotoxin survey data of the Middle East and Africa. I will start with the Middle East and northern part of Africa. On the slide, the involved countries where the samples of complete feed and raw materials have been taken for the mycotoxin surface are all colored in red. From the left to the right on the map, we can see Morocco, Morocco Tunisia, Israel, Jordan, Iran and Kuwait. The red color of the countries indicates that there is an overall high mycotoxin risk level in this Middle East, Northern Africa subregion. The number 55% tells us the risk level, which is even higher than in the European region, as clearly even more than one out of two animals are expected to be exposed to mycotoxin levels, which will negatively impact the production and health status in these animals. On this slide, on the right hand side on the top, we see that all fissarium derived mycotoxins are highly abundant in Middle East. Northern Africa. This is also represented in the gray bars, 220, light gray, 221 in dark. The part of the contaminated samples is shown in the percentage per mycotoxin. Fumonacins are the most abundant with 84% of the samples positive, followed by the oxynivalenol and zeralinol, both also high with respectively 55 and 58 percent. But please also look at the very toxic aflatoxin. Afla increases from 7 percent into 20 to 23 uh, in 21 of the samples being positive. As Wolfgang mentioned before, this is also something to, to take very seriously. It does not only implicate a potential high risk for animals ingesting this toxin, also, indirect transmission to humans via contaminated milk of dairy cow is a huge risk. The colors of the pictograms of the animals show us that the species swine poultry shrimps are at medium to high risk. Shrimps even at high risk for formonocins in Middle East, North Africa. On this slide, corn kernels results are shown. As we have seen before in Europe, 
corn is often heavily contaminated, both in concentration and numbers of mycotoxins per sample. In the table on the top, it becomes clear that the average levels of San, Don and Foom are already quite high. The maximum levels are even worse and implicate high risk for animals. Besides this, the diagram on the left bottom shows us that the prevalence of mycotoxins in corn kernels is also very high, especially for Foom with 95% and Don almost 80% of the samples being positive. The last diagram on the bottom right hand side clearly shows us that on the top of high concentration levels, high prevalence values of mycotoxins, corn kernels, also the numbers of mycotoxins per samples are in more than 80% of the samples above one. Meaning additive and synergistic toxic effects could even worsen negative impact for the animals. The next feed samples are corn DDGS. In DDGS, even higher loads of mycotoxins can be found due to production process of DDGS, which cause enrichments of mycotoxins in this feedstuff. In the table on the top is demonstrated the average mycotoxins concentrations are higher than what we saw in the corn kernels on the former slide. In the diagram on the bottom left, it become also clear that San, Don and Fum were positive in all samples, 100% abundant. Don't forget aflatoxins, which has a prevalence in corn DDGS of 60%, meaning 6 out of 10 DDGS samples contain aflatoxins. This is a big concern and something to be aware of. It is also clear that 100% of the DGS samples contain more than one mycotoxin, meaning again, add additional negative additive or synergistic impact on the animals due to multiple mycotoxin load. The last slide for Middle East and Northern Africa is about the total mixed ration. This is feed pro product mostly used for feeding dairy cows. It is composed of different feed components, often including premixed concentrate, but also roughage like grass and corn, and therefore containing a high moisture content. Looking at the first site, at looking at first site in the table, one might think that the mycotoxin concentration levels are not that high. But as already mentioned by Wolfgang before, it is important to recalculate concentrations to 100% dry matter content of each sample. Generally speaking, the mycotoxin levels in the table will then increase with a factor 2 to 3. Certainly, when looking at the maximum levels found, a um, high mycotoxin risk will be often the case. Again, the prevalence is high and also the number of mycotoxins found uh, in all TMR samples were over one mycotoxin, so multiple contamination per sample. So now I will move to the southern part of Africa. Countries involved are Sudafrika, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Malawi and Kenya. As you can see again on the slide, all those countries in this subregion uh, where the samples have been gathered are also red colored, meaning southern Africa, the, the mycotoxin risk levels are high. Also, the number 66 indicate that the production animals are having a very big chance to ex be exposed to risky loads of mycotoxin, harming the production and health status, almost 7 out of 10. On the top right, in the text boxes, some highlights are noted. So, DOM is almost... Uh, prevalent in all samples with 80%. Also in cereals, Don is highly prevalent with 77% and a maximum level of 2610 PPP was detected. Looking at the gray bars, fumonescence are still highly prevalent with 50%. Don even increased versus last year to 80% prevalence and then was stable with a prevalence of 44%. Again, I would like to point out the prevalence of aflatoxins. 
Although a prevalence is much lower than the former ones I mentioned, be aware that uh, the still almost one out of 10 feed samples can be contaminated with aflatoxins in this southern Africa part. Almost all pictograms of the animals for mycotoxins uh, don are colored orange to red, as well for cattle, swine, poultry and shrimps. The mycotoxin levels and prevalence in compound feed and raw materials in Africa will frequently cause a high risk in those animal species. The mycotoxin samples results of corn kernels in South Africa are shown on this slide. Although average concentration values are slightly lower than what we saw in Middle East and Northern Africa, the maximum levels are still high for Don, Fum and Zen. Also, AFLA concentration can be sometimes very high. This feedstuff becomes worthless and should be destroyed and not fed to animals. Corn gluten in South Africa gives more or less a similar picture as the DGS outcomes in Middle East and Northern Africa. High concentration values of DOM, high maximum values of FUM and ZEN. And as you can see, ZEN and DOM and FUM are prevalent in all samples, all 100%. And therefore, the numbers of mycotoxins per samples are far above one, eh, three to the minimum meaning even at lower individual concentration levels as a consequence of additive and synergistic effect among mycotoxins, risk levels can be higher than expected. Corn silage South Africa is shown on this slide. Don and Zaya are both clearly detected in corn silage, certainly when looking at the maximum concentration levels. High risk for cattle is there. Take a can in Take again into account that the values shown are in fresh meadow values, so at high moisture content. Meaning, multiplication with a factor 2 to 3 is needed to get concentration values in 100% dry matter content. Within the group of trichotocenes B, to which DOM belongs, also many other mycotoxins belong, like nivalenol. In Europe, besides DOM, nivalenol does have a very high prevalence too. So underestimation of the total load of the group of trichotocenes B could be the case here. This slide shows the finished feed swine samples in South Africa. Swine is a more sensitive than other species and therefore low levels of mycotoxins already lead to reduction in production, fertility and health status. And don't forget, in this slide, we talk about complete feed. Both DOM and ZAYA, average levels, as well as maximum levels, can already affect swine. Certainly pigs, but also gilts and sow. Over 20% of the samples contain ZEN, which can harm fertility in sows and young upgrowing gilts. Because 85% of the samples contain more than one mycotoxin, one should be aware again that additive and synergistic mycotoxic effects can occur, meaning that even lower concentration levels of all the individual mycotoxins detected in a feed sample can still pose a medium to high risk. This slide shows the samples of finished feed of poultry. Again, all fusarium mycotoxins are abundant in South Africa. All six were detected, also T2. Don concentration levels at medium high to high risk for poultry. Also, the prevalence of Don is very high with 94%, followed by FUM with 86 and ZEN with 44. Also, AFLA is detected in 14% of the samples. Again, like for these swine before, 86 of the samples contain more than one mycotoxins, and again, take into account additive and synergistic effects. My last slide is showing the total mix ratio of mycotoxins results of South Africa, often fed to dairy cows cattle. A mix ration is composed of different feed components, often including premixed concentration of ravage, like corn and grass silage, as mentioned before, 
is also represented in the very variety of mycotoxins detected again in the TMR. At first sight, the concentration values may not look that high, but don't forget it is TMR and we look at fresh product concentration values in this table. So to obtain concentration levels at 100% dry matter, the concentration values can be roughly increased to factor two to three. Taking this into account, the levels for DOM for the average concentration will go up to circa 1500 PBB and for the maximum concentration even up to 6000 PBB per kilogram dry matter. Also then, the maximum concentration at 100% dry matter ranges will go up from to 180 PBB at average level to 1500 PBB at maximum. Knowing that dairy cows can eat 23 kilograms of dry matter, the mycotoxin risk levels for many TMRs in South Africa can be assessed as a high to extreme high risk. Impaired digestion, fertility issues due to ZEN and health status can be seen in those herds and the genetic milk production potential of these herds will not be obtained. So testing for mycotoxins in TMR is very important in cattle. So I have come to the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you all for your participation to this webinar. And I would like to give the floor back to Jos and Anneliese and looking forward to meeting you again. Also from my side, all the best and have a nice day. Thank you for this detailed information about mycotoxin occurrence. And with this, I want to shift our focus a bit and hear from Romer Labs and product manager Nora Kogelnik, who's joining us again. Hi, Nora. Hi, Tosh. So thousands of samples went into making the results for the World Mycotoxin Survey. But let's step back a little bit and have a look at what it takes to get to these results. So how do we get from a specific lot of grain to precise, accurate, and representative result of its mycotoxin concentration? Thanks, Josh. That's a good question. And it takes us to the heart what we do at Roma Labs. First of all, let me explain what precise, accurate, and representative mean. Precision is about the degree of closeness of measurements with each other, without regard to how the results relate to the actual mycotoxin concentration. In a worst case scenario, you get precise results that are off target, as in the target on the upper right. Accuracy refers to the closeness of the measurements to the target reference value. Hence, a result can be neither precise nor accurate, or precise but not accurate, and the other way around. There are a lot of things we have to keep in mind to make sure our results are both accurate and precise. And it all begins with understanding a few basics about representative sampling. Sampling is crucial for any kind of mycotoxin testing as 88% of result deviation can come from sampling. The reason is that mycotoxins are unevenly distributed in any given grouping of grain. The main objective of sampling is to get a representative sample. Samples used for analysis should have the same average concentration as for example an entire 50 ton truckload. The sample for analysis is very small, 10 to 50 grams. Now, which factors can influence the testing variability when it comes to mycotoxin testing? Sampling and sample preparation are complex processes and harbor pitfalls. Each step within sample preparation process introduces a level of variability that contributes to the total variability within a single analytical result. A variety of studies have shown that the sampling contributes to the highest total uncertainty of around 76%, while the analysis itself just accounts for 3%. This highlights the importance of introducing an accurate sampling plan. Over the next few minutes, I would like to explain you a bit why mycotoxins are often hard to sample for. I'll also share with you a few easy steps you can use to get an accurate result. In general, just a small portion of the whole grain lot could be contaminated with mycotoxin-producing fungi. To help you imagine how small the percentage of contamination is, I will give you an example. We call it the BBB problem. BBB stands for parts per billion. One BBB is equal to one gram of sugar in a swimming pool, 
or a grain of sand in 22 kg. Now you understand how small this amount is and why it's difficult to detect. To receive results representative of your whole grain lot, you need a way to take a sample that is representative of the original lot. Grain kernels contaminated with mycotoxins are not homogeneously distributed and mycotoxins are often grouped together. These clusters of contaminated kernels are known as hotspots. This is why any sampling plan must be set up to account for the random distribution of such hotspots. A larger number of samples, known as incremental samples, is taken from various locations distributed throughout the lot. The selection of the incremental samples ensures that all grains have an equal chance of being selected. What you see here on the right is the typical shape of an operating curve used to evaluate the bias risk, which we in the analytical world call as a false negative and seller's risk as false positive. What does this tell us? All sampling plants will have some kind of sampling error. Bias or consumer's risk describes the probability of a defined sampling plan allowing a batch to be accepted despite the batch exceeding the threshold for contamination. The seller's or producer's risk is that a good batch within acceptable levels of mycotoxin concentration will be misidentified as a bad batch. For comparison, the figure on the left is an illustration of what a poorly theoretically operating curve for an error-free sampling plan looks like. Regulations such as the one you see here from the European Union define the number of incremental samples and other parameters to reduce risk for buyers and sellers. Now you have completed the sampling, what comes next? A good sample needs good sample preparation before you jump into the analysis. So let's look at why sample preparation is important. Mycotoxin producing molds have several different routes of contamination, meaning that mycotoxin can be found on the surface of grains as well as inside them. Fusarium, for example, grows within the kernel, while Aspergillus grows on the surface. This is why we grind. It breaks the kernels to ensure an even distribution of particles. This improves our ability to detect contaminated particles. So, let's say that we now have our 2 kg sample. Now, we are, we are confronted with another problem. You cannot test all 2 kg. This is why we take smaller subportions of the whole ground sample that we use for the actual test. That's another reason why it is important to have a homogeneous sample. In the last part, I would like to explain why the particle size matters. Here we see the results of a study on the effect of particle size on test results. For the study, samples of corn contaminated with aflatoxin were taken and ground to different sizes using different mesh sieves. To evaluate the effect of particle size, different sample volumes, 5 gram, 10 gram, 20 gram, were taken and then analyzed with HPLC and SMS. We calculated the relative standard deviation or coefficient of variation to determine how dissimilar the results were. The lower the standard deviation, the less variation within the data set and the more reliable the result. The study shows that the particle size significantly impacts the coefficient of variation. The lowest CV was reached with a 10 gram sample of which 97% passes through a number 30 mesh. So, what does this mean for you? Keep your grain size small, your sample size large and your mycotoxin results accurate. Okay, you have collected samples from your lot. You have now your homogeneous subsamples. What comes next? You extract your sample and test the extraction. And I'm here to tell you that mycotoxin testing does not need to be slow or complicated. In this final part of my talk, I would like to show you how simple the extraction and analysis of mycotoxin tests can be. While sampling and sample preparation proved crucial for securing accurate and reliable results, testing is not less important, especially when we have a look at the challenges grain traders, millers or feed millers face. Just think of how busy it can get at grain reception points, especially during busy harvest times, when incoming raw materials need to be tested quickly and as simply as possible, while still maintaining high standards of analytical accuracy. A mycotoxin test kit needs to check several boxes. Fast, 
robust to withstand the toughest of conditions at reception points, sensitive enough to meet the regulations for food and feed, one that provides accurate and precise results, and by all means simple to use. At Roma Labs, our focus in the last years was to enable just that. The result was the Argo Strip Pro Vortex test system we launched last year. Customers from around the world confirm that it really does all that and more. Argo Strip Pro Vortex is the ideal solution to test raw materials on site for Afla, Don, Son, Fum and Ota. You can see many of the benefits of the system here, but I'll just mention a couple. It has a quick sample preparation, an assay time of just 4 minutes and the capacity to test 4 samples at once. And most importantly, we eliminated errors with a common extraction and dilution and a very intuitive walk-away operation. You can learn more about Agostrip Vortex at romalabs.com and with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Nora. Now, once a good sample has been taken, there are several different analytical methods to choose from. So now we're going to turn from rapid testing solutions to LCMS MS-based solutions. Yes, I want to focus on multi-mycotoxin methods in our last segments, all based on LCMS-MS, the advantages those methods have and what we can learn from them. So as an example, the Spectrum Top 50 method, it was developed by Roma Labs and was introduced to the market in 2018. In that year, we had around 500 samples, 570 samples analyzed. Now in 2021, we have analyzed over 3,400 samples worldwide. So we have a good data set helping us to learn about the occurrence of many different mycotoxins and metopolites. For many of you, this will be already familiar, but I want to explain it a bit for those who have not heard of it. The Spectrum Top 50 method is a multi-mycotoxin analysis method measuring over 50 mycotoxins, emerging mycotoxins and masked mycotoxins in one run. After the sample is received, it takes five working days until you get the results. And this is of course longer than rapid quick tests, but this method has other advantages. The analysis for single mycotoxins can underestimate the synergistic detrimental effects of mycotoxins on animal health and performance. Our long-term monitoring of mycotoxins in different commodities shows that co-occurrence is the rule and not the exception. I will show some examples later. Further, this method is very sensitive to detect moderate concentrations of mycotoxins and additionally analysis of finished feed is possible. Detected are the main and frequently occurring mycotoxins, so aflatoxins, serolenone and its metabolites, several A trihotisines, the best well-known one T2 toxin, several B trihotisines, the best well-known one dioxinibalinol, further fumonisins, ochrotoxins and several ergot alkaloids. And additionally, masked mycotoxins and emerging mycotoxins and other secondary metabolites are detected. Now what are emerging mycotoxins? They are frequently found on agricultural commodities, they lack regulation and their to toxicity is still under investigation. But some scientific studies already suggested toxic effects. Also, the European Food Safety Authority started to publish some reports on some of the emerging mycotoxins, so showing interest in their occurrence and effects. Now, coming to the masked mycotoxins. Um, they get their name because they cannot be detected by conventional quick analysis methods. It's best to explain this with an example, dioxinibalinol. When the fungi infects a plant and produces this mycotoxin, the plant can, as a defense mechanism, attach a sugar molecule to dioxinibalinol, which is then the mast form. It's DON3 glucoside. Once this mast form is, um, is digested and comes to the intestinal tract of the animal, the sugar molecule is cleaved again and the original dioxinibalinol is present and it can have harmful effects on the animal health. Up to 45% of total dioxinibalinol in cereal samples can be present as DON3 glucoside. Well, let's have a look at the results of all top 50 analysis done in 2021. On this slide, you can see the mycotoxins listed according to their abundance. And to the right, we can see the average of positives concentration and the maximum levels. 
On top is the mycotoxin found most often, which was deoxynivalenol in 60% of the samples. It is colored in orange, which indicates, um, this color indicates the regulated and guideline mycotoxins. We also see fumonisins and serolinone, so the usual suspects. In red, you can now see the masked mycotoxins, and in blue, the emerging mycotoxins. Still among the top five in the list is DON3-glucoside, found in almost every second sample. Also indicated in red are modified mycotoxins, F15 and 3 acetyl deoxynivalenol. Those are metabolites of DON produced by fungi, and again in the gastrointestinal tract, they can be reconverted to the original form of deoxynivalenol. In blue, you see the emerging mycotoxins. And here we can see that monolithamine was the most frequently found, followed by bovaricine, alternariol, and eniatines. So what would we know about effects of those very frequently found emerging mycotoxins? Monolithamine, um, for this toxin, broilers have been suggested to be very susceptible. It can be genotoxic and have negative effects particularly to the heart and also muscular weakness, respiratory distress and immunosuppression have been described. Bovaricine and eniatines showed negative effect on the immune system and alternariol showed no acute toxicity, but chronic exposure still needs to be investigated. I want to show you one more example of corn silage samples from Poland. Um, this was around 40 samples, so not that many. And we can see the emerging mycotoxins, eniatines and monolithamine very frequently. Eniatine B and B1 are even found in every sample. And what is interesting to see here, it's the high occurrence of the different trichotisines within the samples. So deoxynivalenol was detected in all of the samples with a very high concentration. We see again in red the masked modified mycotoxin don 3 glucoside and 15 acetyl deoxynivalenol. And we found nivalenol in 68% of the samples. So what I want to say in mentioning all those toxins that with measuring only deoxynivalenol, we will underestimate the total concentration of trichotisines in these samples. The same is true for the A trichotisines. We found T2 toxin, but at a much higher prevalence, we found HT2 toxin, a metabolite of T2 toxin. It was found in 84% of the samples at the very high average concentration of 200 ppb. So measuring only T2 toxin will underestimate the toxic load the animal is exposed to. Now we are happy that we can offer another multi-mycotoxin method the most advanced and comprehensive method out there developed and perform, performed by our cooperation partners at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences. We call it the Spectrum 380 analysis method. This method detects over 500 different mycotoxins and metabolites, as well as bacterial and plant toxins and metabolites. This is not a routine analysis, but it's used in special cases where we cannot find the cause of a problem in a farm. And additionally, it is a commitment to research to get um, a better picture of the risk that is lying ahead. During the last year, 860 samples were analyzed with this method. We can see that co-contamination is very common. If we look at the graph on the left, we can see on the x-axis the metabolites per sample detected. And on the y-axis, we can see the proportion of samples in percent. And here, then we can see that in 21% of the samples, we found over 60 different metabolites, and on average per sample, 42 metabolites. Besides all those mycotoxin analysis methods, we offer our mycotoxin prediction tool. It predicts the risk of mycotoxin contamination in the upcoming harvest. This tool is available for corn harvest, predicting risk of contamination with aflatoxins, deoxynivalenol, fumonisins and serolinone, and for wheat, for the toxins deoxynivalenol and serolinone. It was developed in close cooperation with universities and relies on models of plant and fungi growth, models of mycotoxin production, crop data and very important, a detailed weather forecast. 
models are adapted with the huge data set of our mycotoxin survey. We hope this tool helps our customers to consider mycotoxin risk in advance and make informed decisions. It does not replace mycotoxin testing, though. Our, mic our predictions start in March for the Northern Hemisphere and go until October, when we switch to the Southern Hemisphere. Here predictions start from October on until March. Currently, we are focusing on predictions for the second corn harvest in South America. Now we have seen our tools to analyze and detect mycotoxins and even to look at mycotoxin risk in advance. We also offer solutions to counteract the negative effects of mycotoxin contamination on animals. As we know that mycotoxins have a very different structure, it needs several strategies to detoxify them. With this in mind, we offer to the market the well-known Mycofix product line that works with three strategies, adsorption, biotransformation and bioprotection. Adsorption biobentonide is a proven solution. It has gone through the full process of EU authorization for binding aflatoxins. Then we have biotransformation components containing the purified enzyme Fumzyme for the degradation of fumonisins, the microorganism BBSH for the breakdown of trichotisines, both authorized by the EU. Senzyme is a new purified enzyme biotransforming serolenone into non-toxic metabolites and the MTV component counteracting ochratoxins. On top of this, the product contains the bioprotection components which are supporting liver health and immune system of the animal, as well as the gastrointestinal barrier. The Microfix product line is the most advanced tool for mycotoxin control. For more information about our product, please contact a DSM representative. We're almost at the end of this webinar, but we don't want to stop without hearing a little bit about what's on our audience's mind. Now, Nora and Annalisa, you've seen some of the questions that members of the audience have asked. Um, let's start with you, Annalisa. Which question particularly caught your attention? One of the questions that particularly caught my attention is, um, can you please explain synergistic effects of mycotoxins? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good question. And synergistic effects, it means that if multiple mycotoxins occur, the effects on the animal will not be the sum of the individual toxins, but it will be a higher effect. So if we put it in math, which is easier to, to explain, 2 plus 3 would not be 5, but would be more than 5. Okay, so this means that if you have two mycotoxins with synergistic effects, that means that uh, whatever effects they have individually, right, when they're together, it's going to be more than just what those two effects are. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. Tricky topic, synergistic effects, right? But uh, always want, we get a lot of questions about this every year, it seems. Right, something that's definitely on our audience's mind. Um, so, uh, Nora, what question, uh, which question stood out to you? Um, one question that caught my eye was if Agastrip or Vortex can be used on matrices, which has not been validated yet. Uh -huh. I cannot recommend to use a test kit on a matrix which is not validated. Why is that? I would then contact a SOS representative and then we can do a matrix check um, to see if the test kit is working on that type of sample. Is this because of the problems with matrix effects? Yes, it is. So each matrix um, behaves different on the test strip and therefore we have to see um, in our laboratory um, how the sample works on our lateral flow devices. All right, all right. We get also get a lot of questions about matrix effects, so True. thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a perennial favorite. Um, all right, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, I'll just throw it back to you, Annalisa. Was there anything else that stood out to you? Any other question you'd like to you'd Yeah, like to just answer? one other question, because we had a focus on this toxin in the last time. It's about serolenone and how yeah. does it affect animals, ruminants, pigs, and poultry. And because time is short already, I want to focus on pig, which is the most sensitive species for this mycotoxin. Um, serolenone, it can interact with the receptors, with the estrogenic receptors, and thus cause an estrogenic effect in the animal, so it's mainly affecting the reproductive system. And in pigs, this can range from um, a shifted estrus to reduced weight of the offspring. It can um, influence the morphology of the uterus and the ovaries. It can lead to a swollen vulva, but also in boars, it can have an effect like reduced sperm motility. So it's really affecting all the reproductive system of the animal. All right. Well, thank you very much. And with that, we're approaching the end of our webinar. 
As usual, you'll be receiving a few goodies from us. You'll receive an email including links to today's recording, the brand new DSM Mycotoxin Survey Annual Report, the latest issue of Spot On from Rummer Labs, and a link to a short on-site mycotoxin testing video within the next 24 hours. You'll be prompted to answer a short survey on today's webinar. It should take about two minutes to complete. By providing your feedback, you allow us to improve our webinar program and identify future topics for discussion. We would appreciate your taking the time to complete the survey. It remains for me to thank our speakers, Anneliese Müller from DSM. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, great thanks to my colleague, Nora Kobelnik from Romer Labs. Thank you, Tosh. This is Joshua Davis from Romer Labs saying, visit us at dsm.com slash ANH or romerlabs.com to learn more about how we can help you develop a mycotoxin detection and management strategy tailored to your needs. Thanks for your attention and your interest, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.